Thanks very much for joining me here on the panel. Um, I'm very interested in the subject of SLAP, which is um, really the big focus here this morning. Uh, but I think before we talk, I suppose everybody here knows what the full form of SLAP is, but, uh, SLAP is, but I'll just say, it's basically strategic lawsuits against public participation. And the whole conversation here is to focus on whether freedom of expression uh, comes in the way of access to justice and vice versa. How do we deal with two sides of that story? So one of the questions that I'm going to start this conversation with is really law being used as a tool of repression for social movements, for public interest. And perhaps Raghav, I'm going to give you uh, the first uh, question there um, by asking you what you think is truly stating of the problem on that front that there is increasingly an interference with um, freedom of expression, speech, journalism, media, uh, by saying we're going to slap a lawsuit against this. So I think slap suits, uh, criminal defamation, civil defamation, all these uh, instruments have been used to essentially suppress the voice of criticism or unfavorable opinion in the last few years and decades. The intended purpose of uh, these defamation suits is certainly not achieved. Uh, and the real, the, the practical purpose of these suits lately has been to suppress free speech. It's not just limited to media. It's, it's, it includes political speech. It includes uh, comments, statements made by activists people who are leading social movements. And these suits, the real objective of these suits is not to achieve monetary compensation from the person, from the accused or from the person who has made these imputations. The real purpose is to drain out the financial resources of the person who is accused or who is the, the defendant in the suit. And to ensure that that person spends the rest of his life or the next few years of his life in courts. A case in point is uh, the leaders of the Aam Aadmi Party. Mr. Kejriwal was facing more than 20 defamation cases across 16 cities of India. So he virtually ended up spending his almost all his time in courts traveling from one place to another. So these are strategic suits which are parked in different jurisdictions so that you end up spending your time, wasting your time, your financial resources, your money, your energy in defending these suits and litigation and do not concentrate on the real work that you're supposed to do. In fact, I'm going to come to you with some of those specific cases as we go. Dilip Chairman, uh, as, as he pointed out, there is uh, a huge interest in trying to not just intimidate but also have a financial impact on the, uh, you know, the other party. Now, we are seeing that in the last 24 hours, I don't know how many of you follow the Panama Papers, but in the last 24 hours, one top investigating journalist of that particular case was killed in a car bomb in Malta. Uh, in the last uh, 48 hours, we've had the famous case um, that's been reported in the media that Anil Amani's company has sued NDTV for hundreds of crores for reporting on the Rafael deal. Uh, these are cases that are coming up every, every single day. I mean, the last, I think, four or five years would have had a large number of defamation cases out there. The Me Too campaign is a great example of how we've got a, a defamation uh, lawsuit against women who have questioned uh, now former minister in the Foreign Affairs Ministry, MJ Akbar. So, Dilip Chirin, it, it's so evident to the civil society and watchers of balanced media that these are intimidation, intimidation tactics. As a PR person, as a person who's also seen media, give us the nuances of how this whole game is being played out. Okay, let just for me to understand. How many of you have uh, watched a news program in the last 24 hours? Okay. How many of you have read a newspaper yesterday morning? I'm excusing today. How many of you have read a newspaper yesterday morning? How many of you get your news from Facebook?
How many from Twitter? Okay, so a lot of you I can see don't actually engage very much with news. I'm guessing many of you study law, right? All of you study law? Yes? Yes. 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 Um, does the real world matter? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, the context, the reason I'm setting the context is that intimidation as a form of, of a tactic is used by powerful individuals and rather mention what's happened to uh, the leaders of the Aadmi Party and you mentioned what's happened to NVTV. So at the other end are usually very powerful individuals who have the ability to one, intimidate, two, use law to their advantage and three, very often have the resources and the first mover advantage in initiating action of this kind. What are their reasons for doing this? From a PR perspective, I can tell you that the first reason to do this is usually those who want to take the victimhood position. So I am a victim, I have been attacked by the media and therefore I am doing this to respond. So that's one of the big reasons they are doing it. So uh, a corporation like Anil Ambani wants to say that we are not the accused in the Rafael deal and therefore we need to take action against media that is make and so they want to take the victimhood position. Okay. Um, you saw uh, recently some other individuals in the Me Too campaign also going, going to court and, and taking injunctions or sending um, not defamation but of course defamation too in the case of one of the Me Too uh, perpetrators. So the plank of wanting to show yourself as victimhood today requires you to go and slap a case of some kind. The, se the second reason they want to do it is in checking the boxes to show that look, we've done our bit to respond to something that's said because very often, and you know, most people may get a glimpse of what an accusation is, but nobody follows it through. So they say that unless I also do my bit in terms of checking the box and doing this, I will be seen as someone who is guilty as charged without being proven. Do you think that this is really um, an action uh, resorted by those who are rich and famous with the uh, lots of patients and teams who can run through these cases in courts because if I was to put the lens of victimhood I can just for a moment imagine what it is for a poor person who doesn't have this sphere of influence and ability to push through cases what would that person uh, you know do and on the other hand let's say the case was slapped on them that's even worse for them and they in, in most cases would like either an out of court settlement, an apology at the end, and you know, this case would fiddle, fizzle out, not leaving any of us richer intellectually about what these cases eventually lead to. Well, that's one reason we should expect all of you in the audience to do a whole bunch of pro bono stuff for victims of incidents like this. Because that is the future. That is where society can see change initiated by people like you. Okay? And I think that the rich, the powerful and the influential have not just the ability to slap the cases, they also have the ability to geographically spread the cases, as Raghav said, to make sure that besides having to fight in court, you also have to spend vast quantities of money traveling and spending your most valuable resource, which is your time. Yeah. So, but the interesting thing is that these cases are rarely put on those who make accusations who are very small because then it doesn't get media coverage so then nobody notices so you will find that the, the people who get slapped with slap kind of cases are people who have the ability to be heard right. and therefore you know that's why media is usually at the receiving end of such stuff like this sure. so rather let's for a moment leave our cases for a side just let's talk about the whole process of this. I mean, at some level, the idea of having, uh, you know, any of these slap suits is highly undemocratic in nature. Essentially, it's like creating gag orders at some level, uh, finding any legal route to do that. 
and for somehow we are probably driven by you know the social media the media in general at a heightened state where people are constantly finding that if something is said or if something comes about uh, you know in, in the media um, this needs to be then uh, slapped with a defamation uh, case or any such lawsuit on the other hand uh, even as a political leader who's at the receiving end do you think media itself uh, is not doing enough homework and landing up in places like these uh, for, for, um, for lack of a better word by not even researching enough sometimes. I think self-regulation of media checks and balances in the world of reporting, news, etc. is a different debate altogether. I think what the, the, what is at the heart of the matter is that powerful individuals rich people who have significant influence and perhaps in some cases influence even on the judiciary have leveraged this tool and I in one of my written statements and quote has called this as something as luxury litigation. They have money, they have resources and they use this to silence the voices of people uh, who, who they think have been making comments which are unfavorable, unfavorable to them. Now what is the outcome of this litigation? Now even if, for example, X is sued by Y and X wins the case, let's say a civil defamation case is filed or a criminal defamation case is filed and that person, the person against whom it is filed, wins the case. It only establishes that that person had the legal right to make that statement. For example, if I accuse X of being a corrupt politician and X sues me in court, the, and if I win the case, the outcome is that I had the legal right to make that statement. It does not mean that now X will be charged with corruption. It does not mean that now X will be charged under the Prevention of Corruption Act, etc. So ultimately, a defamation and fighting a defamation case is so pointless that at the end of it, you are only proving a very limited aspect of free speech that look I had the legal right to make that statement at that point in time. It doesn't mean that that person should be charged with corruption or with sexual assault or harassment and so on and so forth. So I think to my mind the entire concept of defamation, certainly criminal defamation is flawed. It's an outdated law. Most countries, most developed countries and most developed democracies like the United States, like the United Kingdom have abolished criminal defamation. Now criminal defamation attracts punishment as well as imprisonment. It not only attracts monetary compensation, but can uh, land you in jail for a maximum of 24 months. That is an outdated law. It is a colonial legacy that we have inherited and we are still going on with it. I think uh, uh, when there is a right-minded government, not a right-wing-minded government, but a right-minded government at the center, they will perhaps abolish and one of the members of parliament uh, from BJD, if I am not wrong, Mr. Satapati, brought in a, 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 a private member's bill uh, essentially decriminalizing uh, 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 criminal defamation. Yeah. No, but you know, I think at the same, in the same uh, sort of conversation, we have to address the issue of when slap suits or defamation suits actually do become genuine, right? So uh, today, majority of the cases that make the maximum noise are also the ones that have been slapped in some way or the other against uh, onto the media, right? Whether it's NDTV or Rajasthan Patrika back uh, 10 days, 10, 10 to 15 years ago, and so on. So I think what would be interesting for me is to get some perspective, both yours and Dilip's, on the case where genuine cases happen, like the case of Times Now versus um, Justice Sabin. Now, in in general, public could pretty much visibly see the case was in, uh, you know was was a case of um, you know uh, I would say some some department within Times Now uh, did a mistake and nothing was uh, uh, you know it seemed like there was a very valid case for somebody to put defamation so where does one draw these lines so a couple of quick points first is that in order to strike a fine balance between free speech and right to reputation the remedies should be civil in nature. Defamation is a civil wrong, it's a tort. And therefore you can find remedies in civil law. But the criminal aspect of it, criminal defamation is something, to my mind, which should be removed from the statute books. That's one. Number two, as far as media is concerned, and as far as defamation and slap suits attracted by the media are concerned, there is a fine case, a landmark case in the US called New York Times versus 
Sullivan, which I'm sure all these students will read as they go along in their legal career, which lays down the principles of what will essentially constitute a defamation when it comes to reporting by media. And that landmark case, which is also used in Indian courts and cited in Indian courts day in, day out, clearly establishes that media to some extent, after doing their legitimate research, etc., if report something, and after incorporating the comments of the other side, so on and so forth, it, uh, it does report something which is found to be uh, untrue, uh, uh, they still can get some sort of impunity. That's the kind of law that has been laid down. So I think a distinction needs to be brought about between unintentional statements and reckless intentional falsehood. And that has the principles for which have been very beautifully laid down in landmark cases like New York Times versus Sullivan. Sure. Well, I think those two aspects also lend itself to such a large grey area, right? What is intentional and what is not. But well, unfortunately, that's for the courts to decide. Fair enough. That's fair enough. Actually, I'm really missing the presence of a lawyer on this panel. To be honest, and I ask like a third party yeah. say, "What is, is your take on this?" He is actually a lawyer. Yeah, but in that sense, yeah, I'm, I'm a charter accountant. I'm pursuing law. Politically coloured. Uh, Dilip Cherian, you know exactly the same um, uh, issue about he. he mentioned vaguely how self-regulation could be a long debate but I think somewhere the rise of digital has given an opportunity for us to all talk about key issues that civil society or public interest issues didn't have a voice for. So today we are all part and party of conversations across uh, media and I think to an extent I could say even lawyers are finally creating platforms that are able to dissect the law in simple ways. So I mean you guys are probably familiar with about 15 new platforms that have come in. There is a huge role they play in helping us missing, uh, you know, complete the missing links. But in parallel the rise of digital has also led to unsubstantiated, you know, fly-by-night media operators who are coming in and lead to a lot of, uh, you know, unsubstantiated reporting, therefore disrepute, and we are stuck with scenarios where we've got a lot of misinformation that is probably defamatory or probably targeting somebody and questioning who they are. The question is, when we are in such state of flux in terms of media, and defamation is one big tool, how much misuse is likely to stay with us? I think a couple of lawyers I was reading about said, you know, suing, me, suing the messenger is one of our realities of these times. So I'd like you to talk about that. You know, I think it's good to begin with the right to reputation. Because in many senses, the starting point of all this is somebody with the fervent belief that their reputation has been sullied. Okay? Especially with the rise of social media, each of you in the room is actually a media person. So you have the ability to damage the right to anyone to have a reputation, right? With whatever basis you have. And often it is the ability of social media to multiply this to the extent where it becomes actually defamatory, where the person's reputation is seriously damaged on platforms that matter to her or to him. So, too often now, you are seeing that people are making the flimsiest of accusations and thereby begins a whole miasma of, of uh, misleading stuff which leads to damaged reputation. So I think that in the age of social media, the level of responsibilities expected of media, of, of official media, is therefore placed on a much higher pedestal. And, you know, uh, Sullivan aside, the fact is that too many media organizations, platforms, uh, vehicles are running because of the need of speed to publish stuff which is barely fact-checked, which has huge discrepancies in it, errors in it, and too often the people who are victims of this kind of attack actually have no recourse because they don't have what it needs to be able to actually put a bunch of cases to stop this. And when it's on social media, it's almost impossible to trace the original offender. You know, so what happens is, as you said, very often the media house, which then carries what has come through, you know, 
through the process of social media yeah. into public parlance as it were as something which it, it hasn't checked themselves. Right. And, okay, fair enough. What do you tell your clients? Because actually you're on the side of those who are fighting with those media houses. You're uh, constantly talking to clients who are wanting to instantly slap these fat notices. How do you advise them as a PR person? Because you're presumably working with their legal teams as well to understand that uh, a solution needs to be found. I'd like to know what are the, what's the modus operandi uh, as you give advice. Good question. Very often, my first point of advice is don't listen to your lawyer. <laughs> the reason I say that is because usually in issues like this, you're fundamentally scared of your reputation in the public domain. So, as he said, all you can do by this defamation case is fight that till the person recognizes or the law recognizes that she, the media, has the chance to stand up and repeat saying what they have said. It does not prove whether it's right or wrong. What gets proven as right or wrong is what the public feels, is what people feel. And that has a, has a material effect on their ability to sell product, to sell services, whatever it is. Yeah. So my advice to them as a PR person very often is be very careful as to what the courts will finally decide. Don't worry about that. But if you think that there are aspects where you are justified, don't go for defamation. That's just routine. But be able to present your case in a manner where what you say gathers increased conviction in terms of its being believable. And I, I, that's the direction we lead them towards. Fair. Okay, I'll get to that uh, because I do have a follow-up on that. Raghav, uh, in your case, uh, the court, of course, took the stance that a retweet is also defamation, right? And this particular case got a lot of people thinking about what they're retweeting and what they're not. How has this case um, against Arun Jaitley changed the way you present yourself on social media? And internally, what kind of introspection did AAP have as being the social media party to, uh, to think about defamation issues? So as far as that particular case filed by Mr. Jaitley is concerned, uh, I think uh, that case has given me the opportunity to learn law. In fact, it was after I became an accused and a defendant in the criminal and the civil suit respectively that I started pursuing law. So it has been a life-changing experience in a positive way for me. Uh, as far as that particular aspect of law is concerned, whether retweet tant amounts to publication of a statement and thereby perhaps leading to defamation or, uh, or not is uh, something for the courts to decide. I, I think even the Supreme Court did not decide that. The Supreme Court essentially said that we will not get into this aspect at this point in time. It is for the trial court to conduct the trial. There will be witnesses, there will be cross-examination and there will be statements made that whether that particular retweet tantamounts to publication of a statement or not. So I think it was kind of misreported. Uh, the Supreme Court did not exactly say that retweet now means publication of a statement. It only left this to the trial court. That's one. Number two, as far as the introspection, the so-called introspection by the Ahmadi party is concerned, we only came to one conclusion that defamation is an outdated law. It is meant to harass you. Certain individuals and certain agencies are using this to harass you to waste your time, your energy and a drain of your financial resources. And therefore, we thought that the best way to save your time, money, energy and channelize this time, money, energy for the good of the people is to go for out of court settlement and that's exactly what we did. So, you know, one of the things that I believe um, has been an outcome of the New York Times versus Harvey Weinstein case, I don't know whether this is, you know, that's exactly the term of the case, but essentially there is obviously a case there with Harvey Weinstein versus New York Times at some level. Uh, one of the things that uh, is being talked about right now in the US, and I'm wondering if it's a useful tool for India, is to start investigating whether these slap suits are really trying to gag dissent 
or they are genuine defamation at an early stage. I don't know what you feel about it from a political standpoint, but as somebody who was studying law, give us some thought on what your, what your belief is about trying to create a construct like that. Because as everybody here agrees, it is eventually a big, big waste of time if the case is not genuine. And at the same time, if the case is genuine, then it should take a very, very high speed recourse. So as, <coughs> as somebody who's been at the receiving end of these yes. defamation suits, I think the first thing that that person should do is to overcome the fear, the anxiety, uh, uh, and, and, and particularly the fear that how will I fight this case, what will be the outcome of this case, so on and so forth. I know it's very difficult. It took weeks and months for me also to get to overcome the fear and the anxiety that comes with it. Particularly when you're sued by India's second most powerful man. And what that person, the accused in that case needs to do is leverage the trial itself to unearth the truth. If you follow your trial, if you follow the process of law rigorously, if you produce a good written statements, if you produce damn good witnesses, if you have good lawyers and a good legal team on your side, then the process itself uh, unearths the truth and the person who has filed the case realizes that he's done a big mistake by filing this case. So I think a strong individual who's mentally strong, who has the willpower, can sort of turn the tables. And I think a lot of people who are at the receiving end should do that. But at the same time, uh, it's worth mentioning that at the end of the day, it's a sheer waste of time. And what you're, what you're trying to do is prove your a small legal right of making that statement. So, for example, in the case of, uh, uh, I mean, I would not want to name the case, but there are journalists who interact with us. One of, one of uh, the leading in investigative journalists of this country was sued by a big corporate uh, for about 10,000 odd crores as recovery in, in the civil defamation suit. And once he produced his written statements and submitted his list of witnesses in court, the other side, the corporate, started sending feelers to him that look, we want an out-of-court settlement, we don't want to pursue the trial, because he did his homework. He gave a good list of witnesses, he submitted uh, a fantastic written statement and, and the person who had filed the case realized that he'll be caught. And therefore he was forced to withdraw the case. So I, I want to pick that word homework. Dilipcherian, homework, research, evidence, having evidence, of many decades ago, as is the case with the current Me Too campaign, where the defamation uh, suits are being, you know, sort of dished out every uh, every other day. I want to know, these are really grey areas and they're going to remain so. What can we potentially bring to the table of prime time discussions, wherein the law makes, uh, I mean, takes cognizance of the fact that not everybody is going to have enough homework to be able to deal with those defamation cases. As a nation, are we not debating enough on this subject? You know, I think that uh, due process is something that is fundamental to any legal process. That is, you've got to go through the painstaking and very often painful process of being able to reconstruct, prove, because to accuse somebody and to accuse somebody is all right but to be able to hold them guilty in a criminal sense requires you to prove this so you're right that there are not enough conversations about what constitutes the right of or the or the feeling that you have been violated and how is that right to be expressed both in terms of time place and person and actually, when there is a huge time gap between the event and your reporting it, all psychologists will also tell you that sometimes one causation melts into another and you begin to be convinced that what you have felt in a particular situation may actually be the cause of a similar situation having happened later which you wanted to react to and this one becomes the bigger thing or the bigger person. So I'm not, I'm just saying that psychologically there is an issue that unless you're able to prove something, you cannot, if you want due process of law elsewhere, 
in, for example, a wrong water bill, for example. Just take a mundane example. Okay, you've got to prove that this is the water you consume. This was your average consumption over the last six months, and therefore this Directory, water bill. That leaves a great room, a great room for obfuscation of potential uh, description of what had happened. A question that, you know, as you said, the due process could then be any kind of process that could question what you're saying. If that process is going to be different for different things, then... Which it is, right? Because we're humans dealing with different kind of issues. What I'm saying is, whether it's a bill or a water bill which is wrongly put up by the municipal corporation, or whether it is a case of who hit who during an accident or a fracas, there's got to be some level of proof of going through that due process. You cannot mitigate the process of having to go through that. I'm not Raghav, would you like to react to that? I'm really interested in knowing why that so-called due process, and especially for all these young lawyers, this is the question that's going to hit them in the face every single case. What, why not look at cases for the sake of that they are? Like I started my question talking about Me Too, and I can't imagine it being compared with a water bill case. No, I, so, I, I did that I know, I, I, so, that you, so that you can see that in... So um, I'm just saying that in cases where there is not enough evidence, but the defamation case doesn't take that into account, nor does the law. So where would things really stand? I mean, people who are hoping that the courts will look at an issue for the enormity of it, with the very detailed descriptive nature of their uh, reportage on it. Someone give me a lawyer on the stage. <laughs> so, okay. as far as criminal defamation is concerned, in criminal defamation you need to prove beyond reasonable doubt, beyond reasonable doubt that there was an act that was conducted by this person and he is now uh, the perpetrator of that crime. And therefore, the burden of proof is far greater on the accused in a criminal defamation. And therefore, I personally feel that a lot of cases which have now been filed uh, after 15, 20, 30 years of, from the cause of uh, action, when, uh, from the date the cause of action arose, would be difficult to prove in a court of law when it comes to criminal defamation. That's from a purely legal standpoint with my limited understanding of law. In case of a civil litigation, in case of civil defamation, the burden of proof is not that much. You just have to establish uh, that yes, certain activities were, happened and there are reasons to believe that these activities happened and therefore the person needs to be charged and monetary compensation needs to be allotted and therefore you see whether it's the case of MJ Akbar and various others that these people do not go for civil litigation, they only go for criminal defamation. That is the fine difference that I'm trying to and draw. And I think he has a good point there. I, I, I agree. Yeah. Because if you're going for civil, uh, you know, a, a civil suit where you have a monetary liability, yeah. then you don't have to go through this whole business of proving each element of it. The reason they go for, and I think that is where Raghav's initial point is valid, that if you remove the criminal defamation part out, and say that this is outdated, bad in law, and have somebody move a bill and get it off the law books, then the whole process of what you talked about, of, the, of what goes on in the Me Too thing, which is 30 years ago, you don't need to dredge out evidence of that. Yeah. You can actually go and get your restitution in the manner you want. But if it's criminal, then you have to go through this process. Okay, so, you know, I read this before I came, and I think it really kind of struck a chord with me, and I'd like to know both of your thoughts as we wrap this up. Every criticism is not defamation and every person criticized is not defamed. And I think really we need to start debating that issue in our country, whether it's the courts, whether it's the media, whether it's otherwise. I completely agree with that statement. In fact, uh, where we at Perfect Relations advise people is saying that, look, this is not defamation. What they've done is they've damaged your reputation. You may think that's defamation. If you've got a better case, defend yourself and put that out there so that people believe that there is not just one version, there is another version which is your version and hopefully that occupies more public space and in the minds of those who matter. So would you agree with the statement that at many levels slap is just a gag of dissent? Totally.
Tagal. These days, yes. I fully agree that uh, slap suits, defamation suits, etc., by rich and powerful, uh, are being used to uh, are, are being used as tools of legal legal intimidation and uh, to suppress the voice of dissent or unfavorable opinion. And I think at the same time, it's also important to highlight that a fine balance needs to be brought about between right to reputation and right to free speech. And that can only be brought about by a legal intervention by the parliament and not by courts. Courts can only interpret law, uh, can opine on law. They can't create law, they can't manufacture law. They can't, they can't uh, come out with statutes. So it's for the parliament to come out with a law which has been demanded by a lot of activists who, who are in favor of free speech that uh, a civil defamation needs to be codified. There needs to be a proper law that what exactly should constitute defamation and the criminal aspect of it needs to be removed and a fine balance needs to be brought about between right to reputation which also needs to be protected and right to free speech. And until then, there's a great room for debate on all of these. Thank you gentlemen for joining yes, us. Thank you. Thanks very much. We have time for questions? Excellent. Okay. We have five minutes for questions. Um, let's see, far and wide. Can everybody who has questions raise their hands? Fantastic. Could we go back to the lady right there at the end? Yeah, right there. Could you please stand up? Thank you. A mic will come to you, I suppose. Oh yeah, yeah, you have to. We can't have that question, otherwise if she can't speak to a mic. Thank you. Keep it short and make it a question. Uh, good morning to one and all present here. A very uh, enriching discussion indeed. Uh, I'm a final year law student and I'm quite convinced with this whole anti-slap discussion that is going on. However, what I uh, believe is that when we talk about totally eradicating it tomorrow, we we'll also have people saying that, you know, you can't curtail their rights, for, uh, the right to access to justice. So, uh, how far do you think establishing a separate tribunal addressing media cases would be a better option? Since media as a whole is uh, given the status of, a, uh, of, a, of an independent body as judiciary, legislation and executive. So don't, don't you think that is a better idea instead of saying that, you know, uh, as Sir uh, discussed, that criminal def uh, defamation should be removed from the statute and, you know, the statute should accordingly be amended and there should be amendments with respect to taking this back and withdrawing So should there be a tribunal? Exactly. Quick work. Yeah. I think you have a shed mic. So usually tribunals, uh, as far as my understanding uh, is concerned, I think tribunals and special courts are set up when a lot of cases pertaining to a particular matter arise. For example, there is a national company law tribunal looking into the company cases. There is an armed forces tribunal looking into the armed forces cases. There is a CAT uh, looking into cases pertaining to the services matter. Uh, and there are uh, there's the NGT looking into the cases pertaining to environment. So once there is a plethora of cases, a spate of cases pertaining to a particular aspect. A tribunal or a special court is usually uh, uh, constituted. And I think at the speed at which defamation cases are being filed in this country, very soon you will find a special court or a tribunal uh, only dealing with uh, cases pertaining to defamation. I hope that day doesn't come. But it so appears... Having, having uh, worked for defamation, you're saying, rather than just the media. Okay, maybe we'll just get to the next few questions. This side... Okay, there, there are two it questions. It can't be a special, only for the media, it has to be for uh, yes, a particular exactly. uh, uh, genre, genre of law. Genre of law. Which Fair. of the two? Please stand up, both I, of you. Okay, one what? after the other. Uh, my question is that, uh, how can we strike a balance? Uh, what, is, what, what can be the most effective way to strike a balance between right of reputation and right of expression? Yeah, well, yeah, that's really a matter of debate, but let's start with what our panelists here think. You know, uh, the freedom of expression, as long as it is bound by the rules of what appropriate expression is, must be a fundamental and is a fundamental right as we recognize it. The problem begins when somebody's reputation is perhaps either wrongly placed, built on the wrong premises, or has never been questioned. These are three situations where you have someone feeling 
upset or hurt or injured and wanting to go to court about it. So I think that as long as the freedom of expression requires a certain level of research, certain level of responsibility, it is not the right to express yourself in any manner you want because you have an opinion. There's a big difference between expressing your opinion and expressing what you want to say as a fact to damage somebody's reputation. I think th that's where the, the line needs to be drawn. And I think that it's pretty much, uh, once you remove the criminal element out of it, then it's pretty much easy to determine where it was with intent to damage and where damage has actually been caused. Okay, the question from the lady next to me. Next to you, yeah. Good morning, ma'am and sir. My first point to make here would be uh, with regards to the uh, legal standpoint. So in the civil procedure, there is Order 7 rule, I think it's 11, I'm not sure about it. But it does say that there is filtration of cases where the court in the intermediate, like very immediately, can filter out the cases, cases which do not have a primary cause of action or does not have a prima facie case. Sure. So there is where there is already a filtration where the cases will be filtered out where there is no evidence. What's now, the question? Yeah, my, my, my next question would be like in there are many cases where the court has stated that you know we have to go ahead with this case because there are few evidences which need to be argued upon by both the case, both the sides. So the question here is firstly there is freedom of speech or right of the petitioner versus the other side. So isn't freedom of speech or expression on a higher pedestal where a person is mostly allowed to say what they want to and then they will have to go for the entire tedious process of law. Just stating that there, it is a tedious process and then there is a criminal element that those are the later stages of the stage okay. of a case. But don't you think that holds like a higher pedestal than any other facts like there are elements to be uh, have to be which needs to be produced in court and which needs to be I think we kind of get your question Raghav, why don't you take this so as far as the constitution and the statute books are concerned there is no hierarchy uh, when it comes to right to freedom of speech, right to life, right to uh, reputation, right to water, right to clean air, so on and so forth. There is no hierarchy that has been drawn out. But I personally feel that right to free speech is the mother of all liberties. It's the mother of all liberties and all other rights uh, or similar rights flow from that mother right. Uh, however, the courts, particularly the Supreme Court in its uh, uh, constitutional validity of 499 and 500 IPC has very clearly opined that uh, right to reputation is an integral part of right to life. So it would be unfair to challenge the wisdom of the Supreme Court. But I personally feel that right to free speech is and should be the mother of all liberties. That's one. Second, when you talk about Order 7, Rule 11 and how courts sort of at the first stage only filter whether a particular case needs to be entertained in a court of law or not. That filtration process is very basic and primary. That filtration process only account, uh, sort of uh, takes into account that whether a particular statement is made and whether the particular person who has filed this defamation case feels that that statement is defamatory or not. So if I say today that you're a liar, if I say that in a joking way and you file a case against me, the court may try and see that look, that was a mere joke and you need not come to court for this. But if I do a press conference and say that look, you are a liar and I have evidence to prove that you're a liar, the court will take cognizance of that and the trial will go on. So it is for the trial to decide. The, as I say, as I said at the outset, that the process is taxing. The, I've, I've said this in court on a number of occasions that the process itself is the punishment. There is no punishment that will follow. These cases go on for decades, but the process itself is the punishment and that is at the heart of the matter. Okay, I think we'll run out of questions. Oh, question. sorry, run out of time. <laughs> One more question I can last take. Question. Okay, last question. Here, this young girl here. Good morning, ma'am. Everybody, it's, it was my sheer pleasure to, pleasure to be witnessing the discussion. Uh, proceeding with my question, it's very basic and simple. Isn't it fair to uh, call this whole uh, slap as a medium of intimidation 
it's not just a case against all the public participation, rather we could add, uh, call it as a deep pocket versus free expression, what we usually call it. But is it, is it not fair to call all the cases uh, where I can uh, name a plethora of cases like Salman Khan's case or made, uh, the Jayalalita's case, where the deep pocket is, it, is with versus the, uh, the justice that is given. So it's basically that everybody who is rich enough to intimidate the other person or to play with the justice system in India is able to go away with the justice and is able to enjoy the freedom of justice. Rather, the other person who also holds the right of uh, access to justice, access to justice yeah. is unable to gain it. So, yeah. Sure. Thanks. We get your question. I think we've been discussing various facets of this, but yeah, I think you could make these your closing comments as well. So her point is that uh, deep pockets uh, is also the first point of access to justice. You know, who made the point that you should all do a lot of pro bono work? It's the cost of justice. Yeah, it's the cost of justice, right. Of course, I mean, I, I agree with that statement, but uh, you see, ac so this term access to justice uh, has multiple connotations. Somebody who's filing a case who feels that his reputation has been harmed, has been damaged, of course, has to incur a cost, a legal cost to come to court, has to spend time, so on and so forth. And I am all for l l legit civil defamation cases. But lately, we have seen that these tools have been used to throttle free speech. Now you uh, named a particular chief minister, former chief minister of Tamil Nadu. Now that particular chief minister of Tamil Nadu used uh, defamation cases uh, to throttle free speech. And in that particular case, the state, the state of Tamil Nadu used to file cases, not that particular person. Now for example, Mr. Jaitley filed a case in his personal capacity against us. Uh, Mr. J uh, Amit Shah's son, Jay Shah, filed a case against the wire in his personal capacity. Uh, MJ Akbar has filed a case against the, uh, the that particular journalist in his personal capacity. So they will be incurring the cost all by themselves and coming to court. But in some cases we have also seen where ministers, chief ministers have leveraged this tool and have essentially passed on the financial, monetary uh, and the legal burden on the state. So public prosecutors hired by the government of, the, uh, of that particular state, the state government, come to court and fight these cases. So you not only have to fight a defamation case, you also have to fight the might of the state, which is uh, something that w needs a lot of debate and discussion. How many of you listened to the music of a group called the Beatles? Okay. So there's this famous song um, which is called All You Need Is Love and George Harrison was asked many years after uh, the, the music came out uh, what is most critical and he said no it's not love all you need is justice so it's, it's lucky for all of us that he didn't actually sing all you need is justice but it's not love it's justice that you actually need so I'll end with that sure, thank you thank you gentlemen and thank you all for your questions